What is up, Minties? This is the Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, and join me today for a very special episode. I'm going to be talking about the 10 comic books that define me. So, please stay tuned. And welcome back, everybody. Now, this is a list that I have been thinking about doing for a long time, and I didn't know exactly how to word it, because this is a different list than my favorite 10 comic books of all time, my favorite covers of all time, my favorite stories, um, and you won't see any graphic novels in here, because I've done a separate, my 10 best graphic novels list, which I'm sure some of y'all have seen. This is more of a list of the stories comic books that help define who I am, the comic books that stuck with me and will forever stay with me because of either the lessons that they taught me or the things that I have in common with them. So I'd love to know what yours are after I do my list. Leave those comments down below. And if you want to, just let me know what other list you would like to see from me. Like I mentioned, no graphic novels, no omnibus, no trade paperbacks, a single issue. There is a manga because I have to put it in here. Before I kick off the list, I want to mention that there is going to be some spoilers because it is impossible to talk about why these books mean so much to me without getting into spoiler territory. So what I will do is in the notes down below in the description of the video, I'll put the timestamps of when each of these start in case you don't want to know a particular title. But if you don't care about spoilers, then please join in. We're going to kick off this list with Amazing Spider-Man 248. This is part of the Roger Stern run. Uh, the first part of this comic book is about Spider-Man fighting Thunderball, but the second part is what we're focused on, and that is the kid who collects Spider-Man. So it's a story about Timmy, who's a nine-year-old boy who's obsessed with Spider-Man, collects all the newspaper articles, all the things that he can get, like even little bullet shells from fights that Spider-Man has had, and he writes letters to the newspaper wanting to meet Spider-Man. Spider-Man finally decides to go over and meet him. They hang out one night, and Spider-Man like, as a, as a kid, as I read this, I'm like, why is Spider-Man telling him all this? He tells him his origin story. He tells him his uh, powers and how they work. He tells him of his greatest defeat and what's happened in his life. And eventually even reveals his secret identity, that he is Peter Parker. And at the end of the story, you find out that Spider-Man was visiting a cancer center for kids. And that Timmy has just a couple of weeks left to live because he has leukemia. And that story speaks volumes to me because... Spider-Man was just visiting a sick kid. And I think that's very important, is taking the time to talk to people in life. And it's always stuck with me, mainly because, yes, yes, he's seeing a kid, and, and which is why I, I volunteered at centers before. So it, it has always been a part of me. And I'm not saying it's the reason why I volunteered, but it's probably part of it. And the next one up is Animal Man number five, Coyote Gospel. So this is a pretty unique story. This is, of course, during Grant Morrison's run. And it's a story of a cartoon character escaping the cartoon dimension. His name is Crafty. And he's a coyote, but he's like an anthropomorphic coyote. So he walks on his hind legs. And he's very much like Wiley Coyote. He gets run over by a car here in the real world. That's how it all kicks off. And then Buddy, Animal Man, eventually runs into him as he's being hunted by the guy that hit him because he thinks he's a demon. But anyway, he tells him the story of how he escaped or he got kicked out of this cartoon wor world because he was tired of being tortured. And God, as he called him, but um, he's really the artist, decided to just kick him out and make him exile into our world, our dimension, I guess. And at the very end, he ends up getting shot and killed and Buddy's holding him. And then you see the paintbrush drawing the blood, the red on the blood. Now, I thought that always stuck with me because this particular story was like, man, it's like we're all part of somebody else's comic book. Maybe this is all part of somebody else's story. It was so deep. And as a kid, I mean, and, and as an adult and a kid, it's still it's so meta. It's so aware of itself. It's breaking that fourth wall, but doing it so smart. X Factor 68, Endgame Part 4, written by Chris Claremont. This is towards the end of his run, and it's not even an Uncanny X-Men title. Go figure, Uncanny Omar, but I have to go with this one. This one, yes, there's a badass battle between Cyclops and Apocalypse for the final time, where he says the eyes are a window to the soul, and he opens his wide and gave Apocalypse a view of his soul. That's awesome and badass. But what spoke to me more was the very end when he had to give up his son, Nathan christopher summers to a lady that's claiming ascani from that she's from the future and the only way that uh they can save his son is to give the baby to her 
and go back to the future and he will never see his child again. And as a kid, that stuck with me, but more so as an adult, I think of all these families that have to give their kids away and how horrible it is. And it goes back to, like, it's ridiculous to go back to this comic book that he had no idea if this kid was going to live. He had no idea who this lady was. He just trusted his gut and that his kid would live a better life if he did that. And damn, that's, that stuck with me and still stays with me. Saga number one, chapter one. This is by Brian K. Vaughn. So obviously these aren't all stories I grew up with. Some of these I've just read in recent years, including this one. So this is the story of Alana and Marco, who are aliens of opposing sides. It's this Romeo and Juliet story, intergalactic story. But I think of it like as a 15 year old, if I had read this, I was like, man, this is so cool because it's so vulgar there's sex here there's robots having sex this is so edgy now i think the story is really about family and what you're willing to do to sacrifice everything for your kids so it, it, it hits me in another level than oh man this is so cool everybody's cursing there's a guy named the will that's going after no it's 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 such a great story and it sticks with me because it is no matter what because marriage isn't perfect families aren't perfect no matter what, you do everything you can for your family, though. Sandman number eight. Now, I included Sandman in my best graphic novels of all time. And I think issue number eight is the one that got me hooked on the title. It's The Sound of Her Wings is the name of this particular chapter. And pretty much is the story of Morpheus, who's Sandman. And he is down because he's done with his last arc after going through it with Lucifer, after being kidnapped. He's feeling depressed. And who is there to cheer him up? Who I thought at the time was this cute little girl uh, that I assume was related to him. And it turns out to be his sister, Death. And she's not his younger sister. It's his older sister. And through a series of come walk with me and let's go through people's lives towards the end of their lives like she is visiting them because she is death and pretty much holding them at the very end and their wings spread and that the sound is what brings him joy of him reconnecting with his sister so this one is about family and how no matter how down you are they can always try to bring you up and all you got to do is sit there and appreciate the things that you have and, and, it, and it's so weird to say that because we're talking about dreams and death but it just made sense to me and always stuck with me. Now that we're gonna to get to our last five, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe button if you have not subscribed. You'll be seeing a lot more lists from me in the upcoming days just because you know we don't know the status of the comic book market, where it's going. So it's all unexplored territory because of everything going on. And please remember to stay safe and healthy out there. Much love to everybody. Now, let's get to the next five. Whew, gotta keep it together. Uncle Scrooge 296, The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck, Chapter 12, The Richest Duck in the World. Now, it was a 12-part storyline that Don Rosa did that pretty much took all of Carl Bark's stories and put them in chronological order so you could see how he became, how he started from nothing and became the richest duck in the world. So this is the final chapter, and it's the last two pages. Um, where everything is resolved and he decides to jump into his money bin and swim, like if you've seen DuckTales. And Donald is talking to the nephews and he's looking at him and he's like, look at him, all this money, he could have done so much with his life, he could have bought so many things, but all he has to show for his life are these meaningless, cold pieces of metal. And the nephews look at, uh, at Donald Duck and say, I don't know, Uncle Donald, we think you're wrong this time. And as usual, he was. Because when you see the final panel, you see Scrooge looking at each of the coins in his money bin. And each of the coins holds a memory of where he was in his life. And whew, as a collector, as someone that collects um, books and comics, that speaks numbers to me because a lot of these books remind me of where I was at the time. It's not really about having the books themselves, but about the memories that they hold. And I will speak more of that at another time, but man. Astonishing X-Men number six, Gifted part six. Joss Whedon, 
Wolverine's love letter to Uncanny X-Men. Um, you know, we have the return of Colossus. He's back from the dead. We have the team reunited. And this encompasses everything that I love about X-Men. And that's basically just family, right? And the reason it spoke to me was because you know, growing up, you would read things like how it all came together. Like this, you have this black lady from Africa. You have this guy with blue screen skin that can teleport and he stinks after he teleports you have a murderer uh you have this innocent guy from russia uh, you have a native american here that is just super strong and a, a japanese guy that can sh throw fireballs and all these people have nothing in common but one thing and that they're mutants and they have powers and they came together and they're still together and and each of these people like Colossus dying and coming back makes up this family and it's like you know sometimes you can choose your own family it doesn't have to be all blood and I think that's why that one will will stay with me that and the come on I only got two words for you bub fastball special he didn't even have to say it oh, I love that part Ooh, these next three goodness okay JSA 25, The Return of Hawkman Part 3, Seven Devils. Um, so this is during a crossover event with The Return of Hawkman. And it's about resurrection. But the main thing is there's a scene where Jay Garrick, who's the Flash, the gold, Golden Age Flash, and Mr. Terrific, the new Mr. Terrific, are sitting in a kind of like a, a, a room that they can't get out of. And Mr. Terrific is freaking out. And Jay is like, what's going on? I've never seen you like this. And he was like, I don't understand what's going on. My wife and son died in a car accident. I no longer believe in the afterlife. I don't believe in resurrection. I don't believe in souls. I don't understand anything that's going on here. So Jay looks at him and he says, let me tell you something that not nobody knows. And he said, when he came back from the war, he talked about how him and Joan couldn't have any children. And they had they adopted a baby, and the baby boy got pneumonia and ended up dying after two weeks. But he said, you know, the baby lived long enough for me to fall in love with it, and made me think that I was a father. And he looks at Mr. Terrific and says, if there's any damn justice in this universe, you will see your wife and kid again, and I will see my son. Whew. Man. You talk about one of the most powerful moments in comic books for me. Like, there's all these things that happen in JSA. This is Jeff Johns, by the way. And, you know, so, like, epic fights. But that moment defined just, like, they, it doesn't matter what your beliefs are. There's always hope. And I think that's what brings us together. And no, nothing to me said it better than that particular... There's only like two pages, but that's why JSA is one of the best. My favorite Jeff Johns run. So, JSA 25. I promised there would be a manga in here. And it wasn't in my best graphic novels of all time list. So it's here. And that is Berserk. But this particular chapter, Berserk 221, found in the 26th volume of the Tonka Bonds. So... Um, I know I've mentioned spoilers, so just in case, please, I don't want to spoil it for anybody that has reading Berserk through the Deluxe Edition. So, we've seen Guts lose all his friends. We've seen him almost lose his sanity. We've seen Casca lose her sanity and her mind. Like, he's trying to bring that back. He's trying to restore her mind back. You know, he got, he was betrayed by his friend. All his friends are dead. And now, he's with Lady Farnese. Uh, Shirky, Casca with her mind gone, Serpico and Isidro and Puck. And after they helped him defeat one of the big demons, he's looking at them and he's like, and he says companions, or he's thinking companions, and he has a flashback of the band of the hawk of all his friends, like Pippin and all those guys, all the people that are dead now. And he was like, I never thought I'd say that again, or I never thought it would happen again. And I was, that hit me right in the feels. Like this, like you figure my favorite moments would be when he's hacking and slashing all these demons, when he's destroying like these apostles. But no, my favorite moment is when he reminds us that, you know, friends come and go, even though not 
not to that extreme, of course. But there's always going to be there people there for you and whew, companions. That's why Berserk, man, one of the greatest mangas ever. Now for the last one, and I don't know, I'm gonna keep this one together because, like I said before, Starman. I can't talk about this damn book without getting teary-eyed. So we are talking about Starman 72. Oh, we're towards the end of the book. This is James Robinson's magnum opus. It's it's wonderful. It's perfect. Um, so it's Jack Knight, who is the new Starman, with his dad, Ted Knight. And Jack now has a baby. Ted Knight is dying of cancer during this time. And he's going to go off and fight his arch nemesis from the golden age the mist for the last time he knows this is going to be a battle that's going to kill both of them and he looks at jack his son and he says do me a favor as jack is holding the baby he says lie to my grandkid for me tell him how cool his granddad used to be and yes that part gets me every time but even more so is what jack says and jack replies i won't have to lie dad now i read that series through a rough time in my life and i remember thinking even then and every time i reread it that that is the legacy that i want to leave behind like how my kids think of me whether they think i'm cool whether they think i'm funny like it's something they won't have to lie about they know who their father was and nothing says it better to me at least than starman 72 I'm not even going to try to read that title y'all could read it at the bottom but i was <laughs> i was thinking about doing honorable mentions but i didn't want to i didn't want to do that because it's hard to stick to just 10 so those are the 10 comic books that defined who i am um, and before I go any further, here's a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for brand new graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off the cover price. Cheap Graphic Novels prides itself on packaging your books so they arrive safely and in excellent condition, as well as prompt and helpful service. And check out their bargain bin for even greater deals up to 90% off cover price. And for you minties, Cheap Graphic Novels is renting a special promotion. If you're a first-time customer, let them know you were referred by Near Mint Condition at the checkout, and you'll receive a credit for free shipping on your next order. Now, this is only for U.S. customers. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discounts, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. So thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to leave those comments down below as to what your 10 comics. They don't even have to be 10. They can be 5 or they can be 3. I'm going to do a hashtag I sound like an old man on our social media uh to give a let, let, you know let's see other channels do this like uh the omni bros i love for them to do it or uh hardcover comic or curtis from the epic marvel podcast or jim mint or any of these guys that you know i've been reading comic books for a while what are the 10 comic books that define them so thank you again for watching keep an eye on the channel we're going to do a live episode tonight it's going to be the amazing amanda and i um, it's about the digital take on movies and things like that with the current events that we're having. And yeah, keep an eye on our social media. That is at Near Mint Con, where we can update on um, schedules and videos that are being dropped. And we're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe button, notifications button. We can be found on Patreon and on Redbubble. And all of that information is in the description down below. And please, everybody, stay safe and healthy out there.